I'd like to begin with this quote that appeared in the preface of kind of one of the classic of books on uh, structural analysis by Norris and Wilbur in 1960. And in the preface to this analysis book, it said the function of a structural engineer is to design, not to analyze. So they are getting ready to launch all into trying to convince you to do an analysis, and they're telling you that's really, to, they're reminding you that your primary function is design. And I think as the folks that I've been involved with with nonlinear analysis have done it really right. They've always tried to emphasize um, that analysis is a, means to an, to, is a means to an end rather than the end itself. All right? we're, we're trying to design structures, uh, but a key step to getting there is through the structural analysis. Uh, as far as what the role of an analysis might have, for, for many of you it might be quite simple at this point, and that is you're just running the analysis to get forces, moments, and deflections, and immediately plugging those into design equations to confirm the adequacy of the structure. Uh, but for also several of you, um, you perform the analysis to provide better insight to the behavior of the structure. And the premise is, is that the better you understand the structure and its behavior, the better you'll provide for a design. Uh, if we move now to limit states design, I think we all realize that prior to reaching a limit of resistance, some pretty significant nonlinear behavior will occur. Uh, these will include geometrical nonlinear effects, P cap delta, P small delta effects. Uh, it'll include material effects, yielding, cracking, crushing, um, or some combination of the two. All right. So with this in mind, I think you've made a good choice coming this morning and trying to a little, a little, uh, understand a little bit more about nonlinear analysis. Um, if you take a look at where limit states design uh, is, especially with respect to steel, uh, we've just come out with a new specification and in there, um, chapter C, they're telling you um, you need to account for P delta, P cap delta, P small delta effects. They're telling you effectively you need to account for second order effects. There's also a, an appendix that allows you to do um, some inelastic uh, analysis and design as well. Uh, if you go outside of that and, and still in your profession, and with respect to the seismic world, pushover analysis have become quite popular in assessing the ductility of structures. And of course, to do that, you need to do a nonlinear analysis. And now also becoming uh, quite in, in the world here is the use of progressive collapse. And um, clearly, if you're going to watch a structure collapse or try to analyze for it, uh, you're going to be doing a nonlinear analysis. Um, now, there are lots of things that are helping along in that front. Um, the software is, is pretty incredible. It's out there, so we've got some real nice software. Um, on the research side, certainly to complement any of the experimental studies that are done, there's often a lot of um, um, analysis studies as well. Uh, and then on the education front, well, that's part of why you're here today, but also in the schools, uh, which we're trying our best to uh, have a course in nonlinear analysis. Uh, of course, if you think about nonlinear analysis, you've probably divided into two parts. One's the hand methods. So if we think about second order effects, Hand methods might include, for example, moment amplification factors, B1 and B2 factors. Um, on the material side, uh, perhaps you had a course years back in plastic analysis where you studied upper and lower bound theories, and those are were, those were fine as well. Uh, but the real gist of today's uh, talk is, is to look at what that computer is doing. So I'm going to really focus on the computer methods. Now I do have to say there's lots of variations on this front. But really, most of them use some fairly basic concepts, and those are what I hope to get across to you today. Um, now, I will get a little more focus here and there during the lecture, and that is um, going to try to provide you sort of a basis to some software that I hope that at some point or another you'll, you'll download and, and give a try. The software is free, so I'm not up here trying to market something. I just think it's a, it's a nice educational opportunity for you. Um, it's really important to keep in mind that all of these nonlinear analysis methods, hand, computer, or whatever, are approximate. All right? And in no way are they intended to be a substitute, but really only a complement to good engineering. All right. So. all right, well, here's the breakdown of what we're up against for the next hour or so. Um, first, uh, the brief introduction. Well, shh, we're done that. Um, clearly, I'd like to get into some material nonlinear and some geometric nonlinear. Um, unfortunately, though, I found that to, to do that, I had the presentation good to go, and then I was thinking, well, maybe a large portion of the audience really don't even know how the computer gets 
the linear elastic analysis. So I decided to step back and just give a quick review on computer structural analysis. Hopefully it's a review. Uh, but then move forward through material nonlinear analysis, through second order analysis, look at what's called a buckling analysis, also becoming quite popular, provide a quick overview of the software that you have access to through AIC, and then uh, some summary and concluding remarks. So just how does that computer get the results? Well, it does not have a state-of-the-art crystal ball, not, not in any way. Um, really, uh, what it's going to do is apply two basic requirements. Uh, one is equilibrium. All right. So it's going to go and look at every single degree of freedom in that structure, every single displacement component, and it's going to make sure the sum of the forces in each direction equals zero, sum of the moments equals zero about each axis. Uh, unfortunately, that won't give you quite enough equations, especially if the structure is, is indeterminate. So then we need to move on and start looking at some compatibility. And so those equations are going to be in terms of displacements and rotations. Again, one compatibility equation per degree of freedom. Um, and this will actually end up giving you enough equations. The, the problem, though, is that one set of the equations are all in forces and moments, and the other are all in terms of displacements and rotations. So you need this sort of what I'm going to call a translator, that you need to sort of move from apples to oranges or oranges to apples. You need to get everything in a consistent set of terms. Um, now, the fancy folks would call that a constitutive relationship, and uh, a very simple example of that would just be Hooke's Law, stress equals E times strain. But uh, on the analysis side, we've sort of generalized that really to a force displacement relationship. Uh, so F equals K delta. Uh, once we have this translator in place and sort of understand it, what we'll be able to do is rewrite some of the terms in the equilibrium equations in terms of those unknown displacements. Uh, at that point, uh, we'll have this balance of the number of equilibrium equations equaling the number of unknowns. And as the nerds that we are, we're finally, yeah, we're there. And we can solve for these unknown displacements. So what I'd like to do is walk you through this real quickly, just using a simple three-bar truss, um, and just show you how this, how this plays out. And this is probably about the scariest part of the presentation. So bear with me. I just, we're trying to do an, a fly over here, but uh, I, I think maybe you can appreciate it. Uh, well, first thing, of course, is free body diagram. Uh, so we'll take a look at that node D. Um, it uh, applied on it is 40 kips, let's say, in the x direction, the horizontal direction, no force in the vertical direction. But also being applied on that node, on that connection point, are some forces that are coming from each one of those members. So if we take a look at the member of AD, for example, uh, we've got a horizontal force component coming from that member and a vertical force component. And those horizontal and vertical force components, of course, act equal and opposite on that node. And likewise, for member BD, we'll pick up a horizontal and vertical force component. And for member CD, we'll pick up a horizontal and vertical force component. So at this point, what we can do is take a look at that node D, and we can write basically two equilibrium equations, one in the x direction. So with some forces in the x direction, they've got to be equal for our static analysis. So 40 has to equal the sum of each one of, looks like the green arrows here, um, coming from each one of the member forces. Likewise, in the y, a vertical direction, those forces have to sum to zero. Now, this time, we don't have any applied force, so the load is just zero. And again, they have to equal the sum of the three vertical components coming from those three members. <coughs> well, here's where we then need to start moving and taking those member forces and rewriting them in displacements. All right, so we've got the, the forces, and this will be a general equation here. We've got forces acting on the ends of the member. And likewise, what will happen is that member at some point will deform and will pick up some horizontal for this truss member, we'll pick up some horizontal and some vertical deflection at each end. So with a little bit of effort, it gets a little bit scary here, I understand, but we can rewrite uh, each one or express each one of those force components in terms of the end displacements. All right. Now, a key part of this is when you look at that equation relating the member end forces to the member end displacements, you see a bunch of stiffness terms there. And the, the, the million dollar question is, is where do they come from? Uh, well, the little answer at this point, and we'll continue to expand on that, is I think we realize that those stiffness terms are a function of the material and geometric properties of the member, as well as its orientation. 
All right, so we'll explore that in more detail as we go on in the lecture. All right, so we get to get busy here, and we're going to take for each one of those members, all right, for example, member AD, we're going to rewrite the forces on member AD in terms of the displacements. And likewise, we'll do it for member BD and member CD. All right, and thank God the computer's doing it for us, because, you know, writing this all out does become a little tedious. Uh, but, um, but at this point now, we've got each one of the member forces in terms of their displacements, and what we're going to do is take a look at the bottom two equations for each member. The bottom two equations are referring to, for each member, what's going on up at node D there. Okay. So let's then move to the next one. Uh, so here we are. One of our equilibrium equations was summing forces in the x direction. We said we had 40 to the right, and then we had the element forces sort of resisting that, acting to the left. And um, so we had an x component from each member force. Going back to that previous page, finding basically it was the third equation down for each one of the member forces, uh, those are expressed in terms of member end displacements. So what we're going to do here is make a substitution in for those terms, and once we make that substitution, we'll have our equilibrium equation starting to get a little big here, but it's in terms of each one of those displacement components. So now we don't have any member forces in our equilibrium equation. We just have the applied force 40, in the member end displacements and the associated uh, display, uh, the stiffness terms. Well, likewise, we'll do that in the vertical direction. Again, no vertical force, but we do have um, the vertical forces coming from each one of the elements. So same process again. Going back to that previous slide, this will now be grabbing the fourth equation from each one of those. That's the vertical force component for each member. And we'll rewrite that in terms of the displacements. We'll make the substitution. And now we've got another equilibrium equation, the second equilibrium equation, again, in terms of the element, uh, displa element end displacements and the stiffness terms. All right, again, it all equals zero this time because there is no applied force in the vertical direction. So where are we at? Well, at this point, we've got uh, uh, two equilibrium equations in terms of lots of displacements. All right, so the question is, well, what card haven't we played yet? You know, how are we going to get there? Uh, we still have a lot of unknowns and only two equations to solve. Well, I think you realize that the card is basically our compatibility equations. All right? So we need to have consistent deflections where the members are connected together. So up at the top here, member uh, node D, uh, well, all those members are connected together sharing node D. So what this means is if we look at node D in the upper right there, the horizontal and vertical <laughs> deflections uh, well, they have to be the same as those deflections that are occurring at the ends of each member. All right, so if you take a look across the bottom, the horizontal displacements have to be the same at the node as well as the three members that are connecting to it. Looking vertically, same thing again. The vertical displacements have to equal the dis vertical displacements in each one of the members. We've got to have consistent deflections there. We've got to apply compatibility. Uh, we've got some other nice compatibility going on down at the base. And we've got some support conditions. So not only uh, those degrees of freedom have zero displacement, they're restrained from moving, uh, but they also provide us an opportunity to take the member end displacements and set those equal to zero. So again, we've got to have some compatibility down at the bottom. All right. uh, well, now it's time for some serious simplifying. We've got our two equilibrium equations. Um, everywhere we see a U with a subscript and a D, uh, a subscript with a D, uh, this, is, this is the same value. All right? That was what we said when we did our compatibility. All right? Likewise, all the vertical displacements at node D have to be the same value. All right? So that's going to really simplify. It looks like we've got a bunch of unknowns there, but really we've only got two. Then those support conditions, well, those are real handy as well. Those are going to take a lot of those displacement components and say that they're zero. All right? So at this point then, we can take those Fairly ugly looking equations, but after we apply our compatibility, we're going to end up with two equations uh, with two unknowns. And those, uh, we, again, the stiffness terms are known. All right? We're going to talk about how we get there. Uh, but those are known, so we've got two equations with two unknowns. And again, the nerd in us comes out, and we start solving. And uh, we're happy, and we can solve for those two unknown displacement components. Uh, once we have the... Uh, Displacements, of course, now we can return back and get those member forces going to those member end 
uh, those equations that related member end forces to displacements. So we've got the displacements at the end of that member. We can plug it in. We've got our stiffness terms, and we can calculate the, the member end forces. All right? And we can do that for each one of the three members, and, and we're good. So let's take a, a, just a quick run through on the, a summary of what that computer did, uh, what it's doing. Well, it's writing equilibrium equations at each degree of freedom. It's balancing the external loads with the internal loads. Uh, it's rewriting the internal loads or the member end forces in terms of their uh, stiffness and member end displacements. It's substituting into the equilibrium equations. Uh, we simplify those in equilibrium equations significantly by, by applying our equations of compatibility. Again, consistent deflections amongst the members that are connected as well as amongst the uh, support conditions. Well, that's going to now reduce the whole system every time, no matter what. It's going to reduce that, those equilibrium equations uh, down to a balanced system where for every equilibrium equation we'll have an unknown displacement component and we can solve away. Uh, once we've got those, then we can again calculate the member end forces once we've got the displacements. And again, we can go back to our equilibrium equations and we can get the reactions as well. All right, so that's, that's sort of the overview. And uh, I apologize, most of you may already know this. I didn't want to insult anyone's intelligence, but at the same time, some of you may have not seen it for a few years, and I think uh, it's, it's a good starting point. So lots of questions then. Is this how those commercial programs are getting the answer? And it's a yes. Okay, a big yes. All right, it's known as the direct stiffness method, and as you walk through the, the hall down there and see all the software products, and this is how they're getting the answer. They're not applying moment distribution or anything of that sort. All right, they're, they're using this direct stiffness method. Now, uh, will they all give the same answer? Well, if it's a first order static elastic analysis, they better. All right, they should, yeah. Uh, wait a minute, okay, is this really the basis for the finite element method? Yeah, it is, all right? So you might have been just thinking you're coming here today for frame analysis, but it is the finite element method. Uh, now, of course, it's a little bit more tricky getting these stiffness coefficients, and instead of member end forces, or displacements, we calculate stresses and strains. So there's a little bit more to it, uh, but if you just take a look at the fundamental procedure, that's exactly what's going on in the finite element method. So we got uh, two, two big questions then, and of course that is, where do those stiffness coefficients come from? All right, the ones that relate member end forces to member end displacements. Well, that's going to come during this lecture. Uh, what happens now when we go static, nonlinear, or even dynamic? And I'll show you this later on, but just to tip you off right now, we're basically going to apply that same procedure, but we're going to do it in a series of increments. All right, we'll sum up the results of each increments. We'll put the load on a little bit at a time. We'll do our analysis. We'll get the results. We'll do a second analysis, a little bit more load, sum it on to what we got in the first analysis, and we'll step through and get ourselves a solution. All right, and again, more to come on this. Uh, so a couple of important points then from this review. And that's the only opportunity for most computer analysis software to model the actual behavior of the structure is through the member stiffness terms. All right, so those terms are huge to these computer programs. So you want to model first order, second order, material, whatever it is you're out there for, the way those programs are going to get there is by modifying member stiffness. All right, so that's what we've got to keep our eye on. Uh, so we're going to do some review of some member stiffness things. Uh, now, I'd, again, a wide range of audience. If you're one of those folks that are completely in the dark, maybe I'm finally going to throw one slide on there that you say, oh, yeah, I've seen that before. All right, so let's start all the way back in high school and just review stiffness. We'll go very quickly. But, so we've got a simple spring, and we're going to kind of look at the force displacement relation of that spring. You apply some force on the end of it, the spring stretches. All right? If it's a nice linear spring, you're going to get a relationship, a linear relationship, and you can you know, relate the member end force to the displacement that you got, F equals KD. All right? And as simple as that is, and again, don't want to insult anyone's intelligence, if you look back to the fundamental equation in the finite element method, it is F equals KD. So they taught you finite element in high school. Perhaps you didn't realize it. Um, now, they probably didn't do this in high school, but if you take a look at some, uh, what you might call a, a spring in a mouse trap or a clothespin, those are called rotational springs. All right, and those can be sort of generalized in structural engineering to looking at the behavior, bending behavior of members. So before we've got this rotational spring, then we come along and we apply a moment to the end, and associated with that moment, we'll get some rotation. All right, so again, 
Uh, well, we get a linear response. And that relationship between the moment we apply and the rotation is m equals k theta. All right, so it's the analogous to f equals kd. All right, let's, let's get a little bit more serious about this then. Uh, if we take a look at an axial force member, all right, so there's some type of a wide plane section we're looking at from its side. And now we apply some axial force to it, we're going to get some stretch. All right. And at, if we're doing a linear elastic analysis, it'll be a linear response. And uh, again, F equals KD. Now that uh, stiffness that we'll get is a function really of three things. All right. It's a function of the cross-sectional area. The larger that cross-sectional area, the more stiff the member is. It's a function of how long the member is. The longer the member is, uh, the more flexible it is, or the smaller its stiffness. And of course, also with respect to material, it's a function of the material modulus, the elastic ma modulus of the material. Um, and it, if you have more stiff material, you're going to get a more uh, stiff member. All right, so F equals KD, and we're seeing the displacements there. Uh, well, that takes your axial. How about flexure? Well, we'll take a look at two cases here. I can't cover them all, but uh, just two simple ones. The one on the left, we're just going to take and apply a rotation at the right end. So we're going to relate then the moment and the rotation we get. And the one on the right is where we're going to apply a uh, force, and we're going to get a, a di vertical displacement. All right. So again, the stiffness of this member in, in either of these cases is going to be a function of two things, the geometry of the member and the material. So we're just trying to keep it as simple as possible. With respect to the geometry, the key property here is the moment of inertia. You increase that moment of inertia, you're going to increase the bending stiffness. You increase the length of the member, and of course, you're going to decrease the bending stiffness. Moving on to material, uh, you've got your elastic modulus, increase E, you're going to increase stiffness. All right. uh, so if you will, the case on the left is really nothing more than the rotational spring, and the case on the right is just a vertical spring. All right. So keeping it real simple, uh, back to our high school physics. Well, there is one other factor that can impact stiffness. Um, and that's, of course, the orientation of the member. All right. So if you think about a vertical member here, and we're just going to consider a truss member, the more vertical that member is, the less stiffness it has in the horizontal direction. And likewise, the more vertical it is, the more stiffness it will have in the vertical direction. All right. And likewise, go to horizontal direction, we're going to have no stiffness vertically, and we're going to have tons of stiffness in the horizontal direction. All right. And I've sort of snuck in here a little subtle, but I've actually shown you what the stiffness is of those axial force members, EA over L. All right. um, and a little bit ugly equations here, but again, just trying to show you that the orientation of this member is going to impact the stiffness of the member. And that's real important as we do a second order analysis and the geometry of the structure is changing, right? but somehow we need to account for that and we're going to modify stiffness and the way we're going to do it is by changing or by updating the geometry of the structure, accounting for the change in the orientation of the member. All right, well, let's breathe for a second here. Uh, step back, and we've got basically three perspectives. One, what you see. So you've got your steel frame out there and with just 2D frame looking at the side. And on the left, you've got some environmental loads, some wind and thermal loads from that sun and rain and whatever else. On the right, well, you structural engineers always put a lot of force on structures, so you've got some pretty heavy loads. Uh, but you then move on, and you, uh, you, you, you model this in your computer. And then on your computer screen, what you see is sort of a collection of nodes and elements. All right? So that's what we're seeing there. And you've got your wind load, and your dead load, or donkey load, or whatever you've got on the structure. All right? but now let's see what the computer sees from the inside. And what it really sees is a collection of springs. All right? So we've got some rotational springs at each end of the member. We've got some shear springs. All right? And we've got some axial springs accounting for the axial stiff stiffness of the member. And you can see when we move to any one of the places where two members are connected, all right, we're going to have, for example, over there where it says dead load, we're going to have two members that are each contributing stiffness, rotational stiffness, to that degree of freedom. All right. So really what that computer is seeing is an assemblage of equivalent springs. And once it rewrites its, its equilibrium equation, again, a little subtle here, going to a matrix format, but just trying to show you, and when we get all those equilibrium equations, they're going to be in terms of an assembled set of stiffness coefficients. All right. So 
where are we at now? We've reviewed that direct stiffness method. Again, equilibrium, compatibility, trying to get everything in the same uh, terms. We're using a constitutive relationship with translator. Uh, the response of the structure from that computer's perspective is only being controlled by these springs and the stiffness of the members. Uh, first order elastic analysis, you've got two controllers, material property and geometric property. All right, so if we're going to go material nonlinear, we know where we're going to have to hit here. We're going to have to strike on that moment, uh, that modulus elasticity E. So, in fact, that's where we're going to head. So let's head into the material nonlinear domain now. Um, probably the best place to start, again, getting all the way back to fundamentals, is what happens uh, when you do a stress-strain test. All right, so I've taken and just showed you here, we've got a tensile coupon. We're going to apply some force on it. On the vertical axis, we're going to plot stress, okay, the force divided by the cross-sectional area. On the horizontal axis, we'll plot how much that member extends over the gauge length, or what we might call the original length, L. All right, so, um, now, of course, if I were to plot this to scale, uh, you wouldn't be able to see the part that we take advantage of. If we plotted this to scale, the left side would basically be vertical, and then this curve would go way off to the right. Uh, so I've taken some advantage here in going from reality to more of a cartoon, because I need to sort of show you what, what we're going to do. Um, and that is when we do these material nonlinear analysis, we're basically going to assume that the material is elastic up to a certain point. Once it reaches what we might call yield, then we're just going to call it perfectly plastic. All right. well, what does that mean with respect to our computer model? Well, we're going to be monitoring the forces in the members, and when the yield stress, uh, when, when the stress reaches yield, we're going to have been working with a modulus elasticity of E, maybe it was 29,000, and suddenly we're just going to turn it off and set it equal to zero. All right, so that's all. And you hear this, oh, what type of a material model do you use? Elastic, perfectly plastic. It's not that sophisticated. Now, important, and I'm sure you realize this, uh, but um, for typical steel structures where the length to depth ratio is larger than 10, all of the behavior is really being controlled by normal stresses. All right. If you start getting into some sh significant shear deformations, well, that's perhaps a little bit more of an advanced course. We can handle it, uh, but for today's lecture, we'll just go with a more simple problem. All right. Now, those normal stresses are all aligned with the length axis of the member. So who will contribute? To that st uh, those stresses, well, of course, axial force, P over A will. Major and minor axis flexure will. All right, so we're going to pick up some MC over I. The combination of those two effects, all right, P over A plus MC over I, those stresses are additive. And, of course, if we've got some torsion and along with that some warping, um, well, that's going to also provide some stresses. But that's not today. Today is an introduction. All right. But again, those sophisticated programs, you got to just take the next course, they'll account for that as well. Uh, for today's lecture, and, and really most of the software that I see out there, uh, assume that we have an elastic, perfectly plastic material. And this is a, this is a fine assumption uh, for, for steel. All right, well, let's, let's go nonlinear, material nonlinear, and we'll go back to our original axial force member. Uh, originally, we got no force on the end. No stress. Now we're going to apply some, some force, but the force is small, small enough that we don't yield it. All right, so the stresses are low. Nowhere in the cross section do we have any yielding. At that point, the stiffness is, is all happy. We're getting our EA over L that we talked about earlier. Uh, but eventually what's going to happen is we will put enough force on that member to yield it. So everywhere through the cross section now, um, in the, the normal stresses will reach yield. Uh, and again, this occurs at a value of which we, if we for, on a force value, if we take the area and multiply it by the yield stress. Now, once this happens with our elastic, perfectly plastic model, we're basically going to turn off E. We set E equal to zero. So the stiffness of the member is zero, the axial stiffness, and the deflections are just going to fly right off the screen. All right. So a couple of important things here is we've taken a look at the most simple case of axial force. We've developed this concept of what we might call a plastic hinge. Right? And that occurs 
when the axial force reaches the yield load. And again, that yield load is the product of the area and the yield stress. Now, if we want to just you know, get a little bit more fancy perhaps and just take a ratio, it's when the ratio of the axial force to the yield load equals one. All right. That's when we'll get that plastic hinge to form. A little bit more sophisticated, we go to Fletcher, not rocket science, but uh, so we'll sort of walk through these as well. Um, originally, you take this member, and we'll take a look at bending and, and rotation, and we start bending it at the right end there with some moment, and I think you can see on the lower right there, the, the stress distribution will be just what it's always been there, MC over I, so no rocket science there. And as long as that MC over I, that bending stress at the extreme flange tips there, the top and bottom flanges, uh, doesn't hit the yield, and it's not at this point, uh, well, our whole entire section will be elastic. All right? So the stiffness of that member will be what it was earlier for EI over L. If we keep applying more moment, things are going to remain nice and linear right up until the point in which the top and bottom of the flange just reach yield. All right? So now we've reached what we might call the, the yield moment, the moment that it takes just to yield the section. Um, no problem, that section is still alive, but it's going to start going on, undergoing some changes as we apply additional moment. So, all right, let's put a little bit more moment on there. Once we do that, what's going to happen is there's going to be a progression of yielding. All right? And because of the symmetry of our shape and the symmetry of the moment being applied, that yielding is to be symmetric about the top and bottom. So the flanges, both top and bottom, are starting to yield. All right? And you can see, basically, if we assume that that material is elastic, perfectly plastic, nowhere out there are we going to be able to exceed uh, yield. So this is going to be constrained to being a maximum of the yield stress. Okay. Um, all right, well, what does that mean? Well, if we've got a yield section and we're assuming it's elastic, perfectly plastic, we're basically saying then that the modulus elasticity in that zone is zero. Everywhere else, in the red portion there where it's not yielded, well, it's, it's fine, it's still 29,000. So if you take a look now, though, at the product, the bending stiffness of this section, which is product of E and, and the moment of inertia I, um, you can see that it's, it's got to be less than our original full EI that was elastic. And what this then means is our response curve, okay, we're, we're losing stiffness, all right, we lose stiffness, we're going to get more rotation with each increment of moment, and that curve starting to become nonlinear. All right, well, let's keep rocking. We'll put on some more load. Eventually, what's going to happen is we'll pass right through the flanges and into the web. All right? And once we do that, we know for strong axis bending, those, those, those flanges are really, really important to us. But uh, once we lose them, we're going to really start losing stiffness. All right. But it's, it's still alive. It's still got some bending stiffness. The curve's going to become more nonlinear. And uh, so we're somewhere in between now the force that it, the moment that it took to yield it and really the moment that it's going to take to fully yield it. Well, let's keep going. So we put on a little bit more moment. And finally, what's going to happen here is we will fully yield the cross section. All right. Um, so all across the top and all across the bottom half, we're going to have reached yield. All right. At this point, the stiffness of the material everywhere, the E value is zero, hence our bending stiffness is zero. All right? And again, this occurs when the moment reaches what we might call the plastic moment, uh, the plastic section, which is the product of the plastic section modulus and the, and the yield strength. And you apply this when you do your LRFD design. All right? If your member is fully braced, you go up to M sub P. All right? We haven't included resistance factors here, but we could, uh, no problem. All right, so getting back then to uh, kind of a simple material nonlinear model, it seems then that we basically have two, two phases that we'll work out. The first is elastic. We're loading up. Everything's for EI over L. And then eventually that moment's going to reach the plastic moment. And when we get that, we'll get a plastic hinge, and the rotational stiffness at that end of the member will be zero. If we sort of simplify that curve and not try to capture the, uh, the nonlinear part and just go with a bilinear model. The first part right up to M sub P we could call elastic. So even though the material is starting to yield in some places, we'll just say, well, the stiffness is going to continue to be 4 EI. And then once we get up to M sub P, then we're going to throw the switches 
and the bending stiffness of that member is going to be zero, and we'll have a plastic cross-section. Right, so this is a, a, a simple model. We call it a plastic hinge model. And what we basically assume is that the section is either fully elastic or fully plastic, meaning it's at full M sub P. All right, we're going to neglect what's showing there, the green part of the curve, um, that's softening. Now, when does this plastic hinge form? Again, very similar to with the axial force. It equals uh, when the bending moment equals the plastic moment. All right? Or if we just take a ratio of those two, it equals one. Uh, should step back and say, well, geez, we've got a little focused here on plastic hinge models. Uh, they are actually quite powerful, and they're an excellent tool for you to start learning about material nonlinear analysis. So I, I definitely suggest you, you look in that direction for starters. Uh, they're often called concentrated plasticity models, and again, the section is either fully elastic or fully yielded. Uh, now, these models often require um, that only plastic, pla well, they often require that plastic hinges only form at the ends of elements. So you might need to subdivide a little bit to make sure you have an element end where you think you're going to have some significant yielding. Uh, now, there is, of course, a more sophisticated method. <clears throat> uh, this would be called a distributed plasticity. We're still using these line elements. So again, from your computer screen, you just see lines. Uh, it's often called a plastic zone analysis. And in this analysis, they actually capture that gradual yielding through the depth and along the length of the member. So that nonlinear part that we were seeing before, that we said we're just going to ignore that, we'll leave it be elastic or plastic, that gradual nonlinear part, these type of programs will capture. Now they come at a bit of a price. Uh, so computationally, they're a lot more expensive but also they tend to be a bit more accurate. All right? Now, I would say, from my experience, that as the structure becomes more and more redundant, that the difference between these two analyses actually decreases significantly. And of course, if, if you want, you can go the full enchilada and uh, run a 3D finite element with brick elements and, and all of that with those continuum elements, but that's well beyond what you probably need to apply for, for your basic uh, frame analysis. All right, so these would be your programs like Abacus and the like. Fantastic programs, but really intended for a component basis and not a structural basis. So let's take a look at a simple example here. I've got a continuous beam, and I'll use this example throughout my talk. Um, it's a W12 by 65 section. And the left part is 24 feet long. The right part is, is 12 feet long. Uh, we've got a 100 kip load in the center of the left part. Uh, pretty standard steel, 29,000 KSI for the modular elasticity, and our yield strength will be 50 KSI. All right. So what we're going to do here is just use some of the basic thoughts that we had. Um, I've got some screen uh, drops, uh, screen captures uh, from from the program that uh, I've developed, and and uh, so instead of trying to run the program live and risk some computer <laughs> glitches of any sort. Um, I figured it, let's just play it safe here and just, just capture the screen. Um, so here we go. Again, we've got 100 kips on there, and I probably need to sort of explain what, what you're seeing. Um, across the top there, deflected shape. All right, that's cool. We're seeing a deflected shape. All right, it's a first order inelastic analysis. All right, no problem. Increment. Okay, sounds like we're going to put the loads on in increments. Yep, that's what we're doing. At the ninth increment, which occurs at 0.83, the applied load ratio of 0.83, uh, about 83% of that 100. So if you're thinking about that green arrow there, it's at 83.2 kips at this point. When it reaches that point on the left side, we get a plastic hinge. All right, so the cross section has been happy up till now. It's been 4 EI or L or whatever the proper stiffness is there. And now suddenly there's a plastic hinge there. The moment at that point has reached M sub P. Well, the structure's not done can continue to apply load, and when we do, uh, eventually we'll get a second plastic hinge. All right, so the triangles are these plastic hinges. Uh, the second plastic hinge will occur out in the center of the span. All right, and that's going to happen you know, about when that green load there reaches 88.8 .8 tips. All right, at a factor at a load ratio of 0.88. All right. So now what we've got is on the left side uh, a plastic hinge in the center of the beam, a plastic hinge. Now, something very important has kind of taken place. Now, even though we had a plastic hinge on the left side, um, it wasn't done. That structure could continue to take load. Uh, that point on the left side can't resist any more moment. So the rest of the 
structure here is going to have to work a little bit harder, but it does, and it takes on the additional moment. And, but eventually, we will re we'll yield, fully yield the, the, the midpoint there. That's still not a mechanism. This structure is still alive. That 100 kips can still be resisted by the right part of the, uh, of the beam. All right, so it looks like a diving board over there to the right. And uh, so it's, it's still alive, and in fact, um, we'll continue loading this thing until just that application of that 100 kips We'll, we'll get a, a third and final hinge on the right side, and at this point, we've got a plastic mechanism. This structure's done. All right, we've reached the limit of resistance of that beam. So, uh, first of all, you're wondering, do all structures fail exactly at 0.999? No, no, I rigged the example just so the units work out. Uh, it'll, you know, you just gotta keep track of your applied load ratio and the loads that you applied against the structure, all right? Uh, some important things, again, a lot of uh, moment redistribution taking place uh, as the structure was continued to be loaded. The structure was not done until we had a, a, a full mechanism. All right. So if you were designed by Appendix 1 uh, or just an elastic design, so let's say you did elastic design, you would basically be able to get on 83.2 kips on that structure. You'd reach M sub P and you might say, well, that's the end of the structure. If you go to Appendix 1, they'll let you continue on using a plastic design or this inelastic analysis here, and you'll be able to get on what looks like about another 15, 16, 17% on your structure. All right, so a nice advantage of a material nonlinear analysis. If we take a look at the response of the structure, all right, so here, what we're plotting on the vertical axis is that applied green load there. And again, it starts at zero and goes up to 100. And on the right, what we're plotting is the deflection at that point, the mid-span deflection. And I know it's down or negative, but it sort of took the absolute value, so we get a nice positive quadrant in both directions there. Um, the yellow curve being shown there is the results of the first order elastic analysis. All right. uh, the blue curve, well, that's a result of the inelastic analysis. And again, each point that you can see there, each circle on that curve represents a load increment. So we're putting the load increments, looks like I was using about 10 kips at a time. We're putting those load increments, and finally, right around, like I said, about 83 kips, you can see the curve sort of jots. It's no longer linear. It's linear, but continues over a bit to the right. So that's where we departed from our elastic analysis, and the reason we departed is we had some material nonlinear behavior. Now we keep loading, and it's really the impact of that second hinge uh, that occurs at uh, about 89 kips of force. So that second hinge is occurring right there. First hinge is there, second hinge up there. Once that happens, you can see a great drop in the stiffness. So stiffness is, again, the slope. We've got decent stiffness, a slight loss in stiffness due to the left hinge. We get that center hinge, and man, we've lost a lot of stiffness. Finally, right at this point here, up at the top, you know, we, uh, we, we reach that third hinge. At that point, this structure you know, can't resist any additional load, and we start getting a lot of deflection you know, if we even try to apply any additional load. Now, of course, that's a pure bending case. Uh, if we take a look at a similar example, but now apply some axial force. So you'll see up in the upper right here, it looks like the same figure as before. We've got bending moment, but we've also got axial force. All right. Now down at the bottom, what's the impact of this axial force? Well, not, not huge. Uh, the typical, what you've been doing all along, the, the stress distribution in that beam is just P over A plus MC over I. All right. So those stresses are additive. We haven't reached yield yet at all. So everything's nice and happy, and the bending stiffness is not impacted for a first order analysis by the presence of that axial force. So the bending stiffness for this case would still be for EI over L. But if we keep loading this thing up, we'll eventually fully yield the section. And you can see now that uh, the, the everywhere in the cross section, it's yielded. Uh, we've got no stiffness left all right, for this section. Now the important thing that I'm, I'm trying to emphasize here is the behavior is very similar uh, to bending. The impact of the axial force is it did shift the plastic, the, the plastic neutral axis downward. Uh, but another very important impact was that the capacity of the beam was significantly reduced due to the presence of that axial force. So no longer, if you're looking over to the left on the plot there, no longer could the moment reach M sub P, but some value smaller. Right. Um, again, in our computer, simple computer model, we won't worry about that gradual plast plasticity that we're seeing. We'll just assume that this section is either fully elastic or transitions into a fully plastic. 
All right, well, let's take a closer look at that stress distribution when the plastic hinge occurred. We can really resolve this into two parts. Uh, one, if we take the stresses, uh, we can pull out the bending part. Okay, so that's what the first, after the equal sign, the first part there. And then we're going to add that to the right side, and if we pull out of that, the axial force piece. All right, so everything now is nice and symmetric about our neutral axis there. Um, again, we're seeing that the, the, the moment at which we've achieved a plastic hinge uh, is less than m sub p. So that ratio would be m over m sub p would be less than 1. And also, the axial force that it took is less than the yield load. All right, so that ratio of p over py is less than 1. So this is now starting to take us to another, another level that we can start to think about how a computer is going to have a yield criterion built into it. So what I'm plotting here is along the horizontal axis, bending moment divided by m sub p, the plastic moment capacity, and on the vertical axis, the axial force divided by the yield load. All right. So let's do the first case of just axial force. So we march up there, we keep applying load until we fully yield the member and that under axial force. Um, that was one of the cases we looked at. We can look at the pure bending case. All right, so that would be marching all the way across the horizontal axis, no axial force, and we'll be able to achieve the full plastic capacity. But there are, of course, a lot of in-betweens, combinations of axial force and bending, and one of the examples that we looked at basically followed this path here. So when we reach the end, the final dot there all the way to the right, and that's when the plastic hinge form. And again, it was out of value that the axial force was less than the yield, and the bending moment was less than the plastic capacity. Now, we could do this mathematically, no problem, for all the possibilities uh, of all the combinations of axial force and bending. And when we do that, we end up what we call a yield surface. All right, so you'll hear this uh, in, the, in the literature, in the programs, yeah, we use a yield surface model. That's what they're talking about. And they're defining, well, why a surface? It's because they're often working in 3D and this curve come, you know, it comes out and out of plane. Uh, but uh, if you're inside in the surface, your structure is all elastic, and once you reach that surface, you're going to form a plastic hinge. Um, so here's yet another example of a combination of axial force and bending. I uh, just wanted to point out that when you do reach the yield surface, uh, you can move along the yield surface. All right? So what am I saying here is if you reach that yield surface, there's a possibility that that member N can actually redistribute bending moment to its neighboring members to take on additional axial force. All right, so if you take a look at that plot, we reached the yield surface, and then we moved along the yield surface. We can't get outside of the yield surface. Models won't let that happen. And we could certainly unload and end up back within the yield surface, back in the elastic domain. All right, so that's, that's what's pretty much going on here. All right, so let's then talk about the general procedure for nonlinear analysis. Well. As always, it's applying that direct stiffness method that we, we reviewed earlier. Uh, but what we're going to do instead is we're going to apply the loads in increments. All right? So you can see k equals d delta plus df. All right? So an increment of force and a resulting increment of displacement. As we apply each load increment, uh, we're going to be constantly checking at the end of the step of the analysis to see, um, or at, during the analysis, to, to see if any plastic hinges formed in the cross section. If they did, then we'll automatically scale back the load increment so we'll get that plastic hinge to form right at the end of the step. Uh, when we put in that plastic hinge, all right, we're going to now need to reduce the elastic stiffness, and we'll do that with some type of a plastic reduction. All right? So we need to take, if it was just that simple case we were looking at with 4EI over L, we need to have a plastic reduction of minus 4EI over L. We need to get the bending stiffness to zero at that end, if that's the case we're looking at. Uh, and this thing will just keep repeating itself, and then we'll put on an additional incremental load, check to make sure we don't have any plastic hinges, and we'll sum up the results for each increment, and we'll do this until either all the loads are applied or the analysis will stop and indicate that a plastic mechanism is formed and you're done. Right, so that's just an overview of the basic procedure. Uh, what I wanted to do is, is show you what the impact of axial force was in this first order inelastic analysis. So it's the exact same structure, and the only real change is we're going to also have on here 400 kips of axial force going along the member. All right. So if we do that and we run our first order inelastic analysis, 
Uh, it's a little bit more interesting. We get the first hinge to form at 65% of the load. Okay, second hinge at 68% of the load. And then finally, the last hinge, and this thing becomes a mechanism about 73% of the load. Uh, now, if you kind of think back to what was happening when we didn't have the axial force on there, right? and again, we're applying the axial force in the vertical load proportionally. We're doing them together. Uh, but when we didn't have any axial force over there, we looked at the results of this. The first plastic hinge didn't form until about 83% of the load, and we were able to receive, uh, we were able to achieve about 100% of the applied force. Uh, so clearly, having that axial force in there had a major impact on the performance uh, of our beam. Um, so I warn you, when you do start taking a look at different software packages, uh, make sure those packages do account for the interaction of axial force and bending on the yield surface, on, on the yielding behavior. Uh, again, if we were to plot the response curve or vertical load against mid-span deflection, uh, you can see the, the, the elastic curve was the yellow one, the blue one was without any horizontal force, and now that green curve is there and that's with the axial force, and you can see there's a substantial reduction in the capacity of our simple structure here. All right, so that structure is now failing at 73% of the load as opposed to 100% of the load it was without the axial force. Uh, if we take a look at the yield surface itself, and don't want to get into any detail here, but what I'm basically doing is at each spot where there's a plastic hinge, I'm plotting uh, kind of what the uh, interaction of axial force and bending look like at that cross section. And it's kind of fun to, to see uh, at first what's going on here is, of course, the axial force has to remain constant through the whole member, the way I've got that set up. So each set of three dots here should be reflecting the same axial force in a load increment. So we're putting the load increments on and the horizontal coming across. And finally, right at this point here, that first, that yellow curve for the first time hits the yield surface. The blue curve and the magenta curve have not hit the yield surface yet, so they're still elastic. But the yellow one does, and we get our first plastic hinge forming right here. Then we continue loading until we get a second hinge, the, the magenta curve reflecting this hinge hits the yield surface and then we finally get a third hinge blue curve hitting the yield surface um, and again if you take a close-up of what's going on here you can see even though that yellow curve uh, hit the yield surface we can still apply additional load and we did that what happened is there that cross-section started shedding bending moment to its neighbors so it could take on additional axial force and you can see that movement going along the yield surface there yep no, at this point it's all first order, okay? So it's just, uh, like I was saying earlier, um, that yield surface is, is requiring it you know, to just to stay either on the yield surface or back in. Yeah. But that's a great question. <laughs> so it's a nice segue into uh, where we'll go next, and that's with the second order effects. Um, a lot of times this might be called a P-delta analysis. You've got to be a little bit careful there. Uh, you need a program that's going to account for both the P small delta and the P cap delta effects, so make sure you're on. Uh, a lot of folks might call this a geometric nonlinear uh, analysis. It's going to account for these second order effects. So, um, well, what are these second order effects? Well, you've got a little bit of a problem. When you take a look at equilibrium, you know, those really should be formulated on the deformed shape. Right? But you can't do that. You've got sort of a chicken and egg problem. And to get the deformed shape, you need the member forces. But to get the member forces, you needed the displacements of the deformed shape. All right, so a little bit of a difficulty there. So what we're going to do, or what these programs are doing, is they're applying the load in increments. All right? And at the end of each increment, they'll update the geometry, update the stiffness of the members, up, you know, get equilibrium on the deformed shape, and then they'll go for the next increment. All right? So that's more or less how, how things are being handled. So most of your second order programs you will find will be incremental, whether you realize it or not. Well, let's take a look at this general idea of second order effects and what it all means. Well, I've got a simple truss here, and on the left side, I formulated equilibrium on the undeformed shape. And on the right side, I formulated equilibrium on the deformed shape. All right? And the reality of the situation is if you were to work out all the numbers, uh, simply, you would get different reactions and different member forces for those two cases. All right. Now, oh, I guess what I'm saying is that truss is susceptible to second-order effects. Luckily, the deflections are often quite small, 
so uh, you, you tend to not have to worry about them. But well, let's let's look at a case where it's more significant. So bending. All right. So I've got a a uh, cantilevered column here. I'm going to subject it to some horizontal force H and some axial force P. Now, when I do that, then I formulate the equations on the undeformed shape, so I don't know the deflections, well, I get a simple moment diagram and that says M equals H times L. All right. Now, realizing that some of you like to draw your moment diagram on the compression side and others on the tension side, at this point, I'll draw it on the compression side, and later I'll draw it on the tension side, so everybody's happy, but uh, it's a nice linear response. All right. um, if you plot the lateral behavior, as we apply that horizontal force H, we are going to get a liter linear response as if we were to plot H versus the lateral displacement delta. The stiffness there, no problem, 3EI rel cubed, and uh, no problem. Now, let's take a look at the more difficult problem. That's when we formulate it on the deformed shape. Well, the first thing you're going to notice is you're going to pick up a second order moment. All right? And we've got that bending moment from before, h times the length of the column. But also, that axial force has now displaced some amount. It's created an eccentricity, an additional p delta moment. Your moment diagram is going to look about like that. And that's what they're talking about. That's what you need to account for in that specification. Uh, now, just as interesting is what's happening to the response of the structure. All right? Before, over on the left, everything was nice and linear. When you start formulating your equations of equilibrium and working on reality or the deformed shape, uh, the effective stiffness, the effective lateral stiffness is less than that original uh, elastic uh, stiffness, the first order stiffness. So the effective lateral stiffness of this system is being reduced if we're going to start looking at reality and formulating our equilibrium on the deformed shape. All right. Well, that's kind of a hard problem to solve. Let's solve an easy one so you can get an appreciation, perhaps, the, the harder problem. So let's take a look at this very simple example. We've got a strut, an axial force member, um, and just a horizontal, uh, it's a vertical member there. And up at the top, we've got some type of a spring connected to it. All right. So a very simple example. Um, if we uh, look at things on the undeformed shape for this structure, all right, so put that horizontal force and axial force in an undeformed shape. And uh, we do you know, get out our pencil and pen, and, and we plot the horizontal force versus the lateral displacement. We'll get a nice linear response. The only thing resisting the horizontal load is the spring. All right? And so the lateral stiffness is effectively the spring stiffness. All right? um, so straight linear response. Uh, things get a little bit more tricky when you start to formulate things on the deformed shape. So let's do that. Uh, so there's our structure. And we're applying now the horizontal load. Spring starts compressing. Horizontal and vertical forces start both moving to the right. And uh, things are starting to go nonlinear. Right, so if you take a look down at the, over to the right there, and you plot the response of this structure, what you can see is the effective lateral stiffness of the system has been reduced. All right, that's, that's reality. All right, and so the lateral stiffness is less than that spring stiffness. So let's uh, take a closer look, and we can use some mechanics here that isn't rocket science. Um, so here we are. Let's try to formulate our equilibrium on the deformed shape and see what we can pull out of this thing, especially if we're going to focus on the lateral stiffness. All right, so I've got my diagram here. Um, now the first thing I'm going to do is take a little bit of liberty with you here, and I'll kind of write this off shortly, but you can see that the horizontal force, I'm going to call that L prime there, it's effectively the same as the length of the member. I know it's, it's changed by a little bit that L prime is a tad smaller, but uh, it's only a tad. Okay? We'd need some pretty significant deflection to get a, a big difference, and we'll, we'll talk about that later. Um, all right, well, no problem. Let's sum moments about the bottom. If we take the equilibrium of this structure, we've got the reaction in the spring times the length to the right. I know L prime, but we've substituted L for L prime there. We've got the horizontal load acting to, to the right multiplied by the length, and we've got our P delta force. All right, so a little bit of card shuffling there, and we end up solving that in terms of the reaction. We know that the reaction okay, is related to the spring and the displacement. F equals KD. So the reaction over there has to be the product of the spring stiffness and the displacement. So substitution in for that. 
Right. And we're going to divide through by an L. A little bit more math, and we can now solve for the response of H in terms of the displacement. So there, that K spring, stiffness of spring, minus P over L, and that's our effective lateral stiffness. All right. um, so uh, that's, uh, that's why that curve is nonlinear is because as we apply more and more load, that axial force is increasing. As it increases, it tends to reduce the lateral stiffness, and we get this nonlinear response. Now this form is what I pulled out this simple example. I really want to focus on this uh, to, to show you what's going on here. So some thoughts. Well, you made that assumption, you know, the nitpickers are always out to get us on that L equaling L prime. Um, the fact of the matter is, is unless your deflections are huge, and the deflection is more than 20% of the length of the beam, um, that's not a problem at all. Go ahead and apply Pythagorean's theorem to that and you'll find the same thing. Uh, well, still though, you never know what you folks are going to do. Uh, so with the remedi remedy there is to actually do an incremental analysis. So what they'll do is they'll apply, and the software companies there will apply uh, a small amount of load, 10% of the load, um, and at the end of that step, they will update the geometry. And then they'll apply a little bit more load. All right, so by updating the geometry, they're accounting for that difference between L and L prime as you move through the load analysis. Uh, another thing, though, is you have to keep in mind that you folks have designed structures with you know, limits of delta L less than 1 over 400, so worrying about 1 over 5 is, is quite extreme. Uh, but really what I was after in showing you this example is this general form that this equation takes on, and that is that the second order elastic stiffness of the structure is really the first order elastic stiffness modified by some geometric stiffness. All right? And if the force is compressive, it's, it's a negative value like minus P over L. All right, so you will hear as you're looking at software, oh, how do you account for second order effects? Well, we use a geometric stiffness matrix or something like that. This is how they're doing it. All right. So let's take a, one more look at this geometric stiffness. Um, again, uh, it will decrease. Right? The lateral stiffness of that structure is going to decrease as the structure is more compressed. All right? the kg is negative for a compressive force. All right? It's the, what I might call the backpacker example. You ever done any backpacking and you're walking around there and you don't have your backpack on while well, you're nice and stable and people can push you around and no problem. You put on your 50 pound backpack and somebody comes up and gives you a little push and you've just about collapsed. All right? So your, <laughs> your lateral stiffness is significantly reduced as a result putting on that backpack and compressing your legs there. Uh, well just the opposite of course is going to happen in these programs and you should be aware and there's typically no switches so if that member is in tension this stiffness will increase. All right? So you might not have EA over L there working for you. You may pick up some additional stiffness uh, as a result of this geometric nonlinear effect. And the example here is, is a guitar string. All right? We know we can change the frequency of that guitar string, the noise, by tightening the guitar string. That change in frequency is the change in stiffness, uh, the effective stiffness of that guitar string. All right? um, so uh, the program that I've developed, and a lot of the commercial programs use a geometric stiffness approach. Uh, there are other ways to get there. Um, we call stability functions or something like that, and that's why I've made a copy of all the notes for you, so you'd sort of start, you know, you can read more on each area. Uh, but you've got to sort of sort out what the software package is using and how they're accounting for that. Uh, well, let's get back to, to real members then. That was that simple, uh, you know, spring system. Well, if you take a look at real members in either, you know, let's take the flexural case here, uh, we've got some bending moment and some axial force. That stiffness uh, for, it's now elastic, but second order, the stiffness is again going to be impacted by the geometry, moment of inertia, and the length of the member, just like we saw earlier. It's also going to be impacted by the elastic modulus. All right, but this was the gentleman's question. Um, in this case, we've gone second order. So it's also going to be impacted by the axial force. All right? And if it's a compressive force, like the one I'm showing, we are going to reduce the stiffness of that member. All right? So the flexural stiffness or the bending stiffness, the relationship between m and theta, is now a function of axial force. All right? Over on the right, the shear stiffness or the vertical stiffness of that system is again a function of the axial force. All right? The force is compressive, you're going to be losing stiffness. 
Uh, if you actually put some numbers to this, all right, so it's getting a little nitty gritty. Um, the bending stiffness before we had seen was 4 EI over L. If you actually do the mathematics, the geometric stiffness is actually 2 PL over 15. All right, so some math there, but you can get there. But again, just highlighting that in these programs, these are the type of terms that they're using to reduce the stiffness. And again, it's a function of the axial force in the member compressive degrading the force. All right, so in both cases, the elastic second order stiffness is basically the sum of the first order elastic stiffness and this geometric stiffness term, this re reducer. All right. Uh, I don't think I have any arrow showing up. Let's see. On the right side, 12 EI over L cubed minus 6P over 5L. So in both cases, the L should be in the denominator. Uh, on the right side, uh, yeah, that's actually, uh, do I have that right? Did I? I think I have that right, Don. Yeah. If you actually work the mathematics. I see you're talking on the left side there. Yeah, 2P L over 15. That one. Sorry. Uh, for, so for a geometric nonlinear analysis, again, just the ABCs of how it's doing. It's applying the direct stiffness method, but again, those loads are being put on in increments. So the increase in force is equal to K times the associated increase in incremental deflection. Uh, what we'll do then is during each step, all right, at the start of each step of the analysis, we'll put on a little bit load. Uh, we'll modify the member stiffness to account for those member forces. Um, and that modification is given by that geometric stiffness. Uh, at the end of the load increment, we'll update the geometry. All right? So that's going to account for those nitpickers that are worried about the really large deflection cases. Maybe your geometric stiffness matrix isn't capturing that. All right? um, and we'll continue to do this as we, as we step through the analysis. Now, not only uh, and we'll accumulate the results, and, one of two things is going to happen. Hopefully what happens is you get all the load on there and you've got a happy structure and you've done your second order analysis. The other possibility is while it's putting on the load, it may detect an elastic instability and say, no, your structure collapsed. You know, oh man, you've got to go back and redesign there. All right, so. uh, here's uh, for my simple case just what a second order elastic analysis would look like. Um, so just ran the program, second order. And in this case, you know, we get a small amount of difference between the response curve for elastic, first order elastic, which is yellow, and then the white curve with the circles. The circles, again, indicating an incremental analysis. Uh, they're, they're in white there. All right, so. um, I think this is probably why you're doing the second order analysis, is to see what happens to your moments. All right, so what I've plotted here, grab some screen, screen captures, is on the bottom is the moment diagram if we were to take this case and just do a first order elastic analysis. On the top is what the moment diagram looks like, and now I'm plotting it on the tangent side for you, for you folks there. And, um, and uh, you can see that the moments actually on the top one, which are for the second order elastic, are about 10% higher than what the moments were down at the bottom. Okay? So there is this possibility that those moments are going to increase a realistic possibility, and that's why the specification is saying you need to account for second order effects. All right. A program like this with that uh, updating the geometry and, uh, and using a geometric stiffness matrix is by default accounting for both the P small delta effect and the P cap delta effect. All right. So it's getting both. Uh, you may find that uh, for the analysis you're looking at, you may need to subdivide those columns into a few elements. Some of the programs will do that automatically for you. Uh, others won't, but um, it, typically two elements per column are adequate for the design purposes. All right, well now, now we're really going to get fancy. We've got the second order stuff down. We've got the material nonlinear stuff down. So we can actually do both. All right, so we can combine the two. And I just kind of couldn't help myself, but we're all the way there. Uh, let's take a look at the combination of a second order inelastic analysis. Uh, again, we we'll go to an incremental analysis. It employs the direct stiffness method in each increment. Both things are a little bit wider here. We're going to have the elastic stiffness being accounted for, reductions due to the axial force effect, the geometric stiffness, and also the plastic reduction. Right? If there's a yield hinge or something like that, we're going to reduce the, the, uh, the, uh, the stiffness of the member to account for yielding. 
All right, so all of that's going in. Uh, we'll update that geometry at the end of each step. And then finally, we'll just keep repeating steps, accumulating our results until either all the load's been applied or we reach what we might call an inelastic instability, a combination of geometric effects and material yielding causing this structure to collapse in some sort, reach a limit of resistance. So sure enough, here's our example. And uh, well, what was the impact of doing a second order? Well, down at the bottom, I plotted for you a first order analysis. Uh, there, we achieved the limit of resistance by three plastic hinges uh, forming at about 73.2 kips, about 73% of the load. We got on there and the, uh, the structure uh, reached a mechanism. We incorporate second order effects. That, of course, increases our moments. Increased moments means we're going to reach that yield surface quicker. Uh, when we reach the yield surface quicker, we're going to get uh, a limit of resistance at a smaller amount. All right? So you can see we went from about holding, being able to resist about 73% of the load down to about 67% of the load. So that's the impact of, um, of the second order effects. Well, now things are really starting to get exciting on our plot here. We've got all kinds of results. So we've got what we started with, our first order elastic. And then we've got a second order elastic, no yielding. The blue curve there is showing you what happens in the plastic mechanism, no axial force. And then we went to green as a result of applying uh, the axial force, still first order inelastic. And then finally now, we've decided, well, we're going to do the whole show. We'll run a second order inelastic. And you can see that we've sort of plateaued out there. We're at that magenta curve. And again, we're taking another hit as a result of the second order effects. All right, so all of this is, is, is pounding away at your structure. Well, one more stop. All right, you've done wonderful. We've done the review. We've done material nonlinear. We've done second order. Um, I, I got one more for you here, and that's the critical load analysis. All right. Um, now first, I need to step back and what's a critical load again? No, no problem. Uh, I'm going to use a kind of a loose definition here of buckling. It's basically buckling occurs when the equilibrium can be satisfied by more than one deformed shape. All right, so it's kind of weird. What, what does that mean? So let's take an example. We've got a, a little cantilevered <coughs> column here and we're squishing it. All right? And as we apply some additional load, we'd expect the column to squish down. No problem. EA over L, we're getting some deflection. And that's a fine solution. But what will happen then is if you keep squishing this thing down, eventually the computer, or not computer, reality, it has a choice. It can either continue to squish down or the thing can buckle and it can move to the right. All right? And of course it's always going to take the, the least energy mode, which is the one you don't want, and that's, that's the buckle shape. All right? so, so that's what's going on just in general structural engineering terms and we'll review your buckling principles with you. Right, the, the question then is, well, how is the computer going to do that? All right. It doesn't have Euler built into it or something like that. So I've uh, got to step back and see, well, let's, let's take a look. Uh, well, first, from today's lecture, we know that if we're talking elastic, so let's do an elastic critical load, that the elastic stiffness, okay, as a function of two things. One, the first order stiffness, which was in turn a function of area, moment of inertia, length, modulus elasticity. And a second part, which was a function of the axial force and the length. All right, now that geometric stiffness term, again, you, we've got to emphasize, is directly proportional to the axial force. All right. Well, if we take those individual contributions of stiffness and put them all into our equilibrium equations for the entire structure, uh, we can sort of separate the elastic stiffness of the structure into two parts. One of them being all that represents the elastic stiffness. That's where we started today. And the second part, sort of that part that's kind of taking away stiffness, that geometric stiffness. All right. So that geometric stiffness, the capital K there, is, a fun is, is just basically the sum of all the element stiffnesses, the small kgs uh, that are being added. Uh, and again, if the small ones were proportional to the force, the large one's going to also be proportional to the force. All right, so the geometric stiffness for the entire structure is directly a proportional to the applied force. You double it, you're going to double the internal force distribution, you're going to double kg. All right, so double the applied forces, double the internal forces, double kg. All right. Now, 
to the computer, all right, I don't want to scare you out of the room on this one, but to the computer, buckling will occur when our equilibrium equations suddenly permit a non-unique solution. Well, we said that earlier, and that was we physically said, okay, that's what's happening. To the computer, what that means is the determinant of that stiffness matrix goes to zero. All right. Oh, geez. Well, let's not worry too deep about that. Let's uh, see where we go. So let's take a real simple example, and to see if I can demonstrate to you what what the computer's doing, and you don't have to do any determinants or anything like that. Well, so here's an example intended to demonstrate uh, elastic critical buckling load. Um, what we basically have here is a pretty simple system. We've got a column. The column has axial stiffness, bending stiffness. Um, but at the top, just for simplicity, I'm going to put on a rigid beam just so it's a nice, simple, clean example. All right. uh, well, let's step back. All lecture, we've been talking about stiffness. So let's see what's going on with respect to the key stiffness term. So I take my structure here. And if I apply both the horizontal force and that axial force, the vertical force, I'll get some lateral displacement and I'll get some vertical displacement. All right. um, now, the relationship between the axial force and the vertical displacement, well, that's vertical stiffness. All right. So effectively, what we're looking at here is a structure that has a vertical spring, all, right. all the way back to high school physics. In the horizontal direction, same type of thing. We've got a, a lateral spring, if you will. This time, we don't actually get to see the spring like in that real simple example, but the resistance is coming through bending of that column. All right. uh, so I actually provided you these equations earlier. Uh, you know, the, kind of turn your head and look at the side of what this was. The lateral stiffness of the system was the applied lateral force H okay, and related to the lateral displacement. So K lateral is in there. Um, and for our elastic structure, it was 12 EI rel cubed. Look back several sides, you'll see that. And again, that reduction that's going to occur as a result of the axial force. All right, so we've got that axial force in there. It's going to be ticking away at the lateral stiffness. All right, that's the geometric force part. Okay, so I think with that, I can get you there now. Uh, first thing we're going to do is we'll apply a reference load. All right, what most programs will do is they'll just apply the load you put on the structure. All right, so, so let's say we have P on there. We apply and run a first-order elastic analysis. That's going to turn out to tell us, let's say, that the axial force in that member is P. All right. All right. Then we'll determine the load factor, lambda, at which the stiffness of this structure degrades to suddenly it doesn't want to go vertical anymore. It wants to go horizontal. So this is a load factor that we're going to try to solve for. All right. So if we took a look at the previous side, the lateral stiffness was equal to 12 EI rel cubed, that's the elastic stiffness, first order, minus, if we just had P on there, it would be 6P over 5L, but with this load factor in there, lambda, it, will, it just scales directly to whatever lambda is. All right. We're going to reach buckling when that lateral stiffness goes to zero. Work the mathematics there, and we can solve for lambda P being 10 EI over L squared. All right. Uh, so the critical buckling load, then, is that load factor being multiplied against that axial force. All right? And for our very simple one-member example, it's 10 EI over L squared. Theoretically, what we're uh, looking at here is the uh, pi squared EI over L squared. All right? That's what Euler would have told us. And, and it's, it's, it's neat. You know, we're within, oh, man. I don't know, less than a percent, that's for sure, maybe 2% of the theoretical solution. And again, if that's not good enough for you, you'll get right on top of it if you subdivide that column into two elements. All right. So something to think about there that, you know, it gives fairly decent results. Now, a lot of these uh, computer programs, uh, you're doing this buckling analysis to back calculate a K factor. All right. uh, so be real careful doing that. Uh, hopefully, uh, you're going to step away from k-factors in the future and start applying this direct analysis method and won't have to do that. But still, I think the critical load analysis does provide you some interesting insight to the behavior of your structure. Uh, so going back to our simple example, uh, I just couldn't help myself, so we apply an elastic critical load analysis on this thing. And uh, what I find is that the buckling load ratio is 9.38 or roughly 9.4. All right, so this is how this column's buckling. Again, 
due to all the other effects, the second order effects and the plastic hinges and all that, which is not included in this analysis, we couldn't get above, at best, uh, maybe 85% of that load. All right, so the elastic critical load, you've got to be careful what it's telling you. Uh, if it starts getting close to one, well, you've got some issues. All right? um, now, we do have some options more advanced if you want to continue on and do inelastic critical loads. And when you do that, still not a plastic hinge analysis, but we can account for some reductions in material strength due to the presence of axial force. And there, our critical buckling load factor drops all the way from 9.4 down to 1.7. So we're getting closer, but still the, the best indicator of what's going on was that second order inelastic analysis. So some thoughts on, and this is a real scary slide, so I'll just move through it quickly. Critical load analysis. First, you apply a reference load and you perform a linear elastic analysis, first order elastic analysis. Second, okay, you've got the force distribution for that reference load, so you can separate out an elastic and a geometric stiffness term. And then the third thing you're going to do here is you're going to find out at what point, okay, at what load factor would the determinant, if you will, of that stiffness matrix go to zero. So at what point does the elastic stiffness de degraded so much that we can have more than one possible solution? All right? And I've heard some of you joke around between each other, well, what type of analysis? Oh, I'm going to do an eigenvalue analysis. And you didn't have a clue what it said, but you just want to sound cool with your buddies. This is what it's doing. All right? it's, an, it's not a big deal. All right? Fancy words. Uh, the eigenvalues correspond to the buckling loads. The eigenvectors, the, uh, I'm sorry, eigenvalues, the load factors, the eigenvectors, the buckling modes. Uh, again, uh, on these type of analysis, uh, the accuracy of them will increase with more elements that you use to represent compression numbers. Uh, my work, I often find two will get you there. If you're needing more than two, then you've got a pretty interesting structure to begin with. Um, so, where are we at? Well, we've, we've done our basic introduction. We're not done yet. This is usually where the students pack up the bags, and I'm still trying to lecture. But, uh, but uh, I'd like to draw an analogy between this and, and learning to drive a car. All right? So where do you go from here? Well, like I said, it's learning to drive the car. Well, first thing is, is I did take quite a bit of time to try to get these slides in, in clear order and make printouts for you. Go back and take a look at them. Um, these are, you know, if, if you take our matrix book and keep breaking down like Mr. Atkinson was saying yesterday, you'll eventually get here. Um, I did show my slides to Mr. Atkinson. Were any of you at the PowerPoint presentation yesterday? A very interesting thing happened. He took a look at my slides and then he pulled out an entire container of Vioxx and he took all of it. So, uh, just, <laughs> just kidding. Uh, anyway, so review the slides, equivalent to reading the driver's manual. Um, acquire some nonlinear analysis software. All right, so you might already have this in the office. That would be the equivalent of borrowing your friend's car. Work lots of examples. All right, so go out, have some fun, try it out in low risk situations. Uh, it's going to be a little bit scary for first. At first, you know, go for a drive, and then hopefully you'll start applying it. It is not NASCAR. All right, it's not at that level, uh, but it's uh, like I said for second order right now. It's a requirement, so you really need to to have a little bit of background of what that computer's doing. And I think today's presentation can, can, can t make, give you a pretty good step in that direction. So there you are driving away. Um, so a little bit about acquiring some nonlinear analysis software. Well, first, there are commercial programs that are out there. Um, the thing that we have found uh, is that the commercial programs, it's a pretty big step, you know, maybe a little bit overwhelming. So we found this at the university. And, so um, we did a few years back was develop some educational software called Mastan 2. All right? So I just wanted to show you how you could get on to this and, and use it. And then, um, you know, if you want to go on and keep using it, no problem. It's educational software. It's not meant for design or anything like that. But, um, you know, then maybe you'll have a smoother transition into using the more advanced commercial programs. So like I said, it's educational software. Uh, it's, it has a graphical user interface, interface that's similar to commercial programs, but we've really worked hard to limit the pre- and post-processing options to keep the learning curve at a bare-bones minimum. All right? So you can get the structure in there, you can run the analysis real easy, uh, but if you're looking to have these features that generate domes automatically and that kind of stuff, th those aren't, you're not going to find those there. Um, it, uh, we have a textbook that's out, uh, but you can also get this online. 
and probably uh, two spots, one just going directly to the website that I've set up, or AIC now has been kind enough to put it on their steel tools and uh, site. So if you go to AIC.org and then and click on the steel tools tab, you'll find a, a link to Mastan 2. Well, if I had showed you this slide at the beginning of the day, you probably would have run out of the room, but uh, this is it. I mean, it basically has five different levels of analysis, first and second order, elastic and inelastic. It's got some critical load in there. And you can see, the, you know, these were scary pitches at the beginning of the day. I have a one small typo there. The first order elastic uh, should just be, well, they're all kind of screwy there. Uh, <laughs> anyway, first order elastic should just be KE. The second order elastic would be KE plus KG. Uh, first order inelastic, KE plus KP. And then finally, the second order inelastic would be the full enchilada. All right, so sorry about that. Uh, uh, it does use a yield surface account, uh, so it's a plastic hinge program. And that yield surface is a function of uh, the axial force and the major and minor axis bending. Uh, I was just thinking of, you know, in the classroom, you always try to turn that into a learning opportunity. So I should have said it's a quiz. Which ones do you need to cross out to get the right answer? Here? Anyway, apologize for that. Um, so now, with a piece of software like that, and, and, you, and you spend a little bit of time with it, you, well, we've got the actual response in your mind. You know, here's a small frame. We apply some horizontal load and some gravity load on it. And, uh, well, it's going to be nonlinear. There's going to be material nonlinear behavior in that, geometric nonlinear behavior, as it reaches its limit of resistance. So what we're plotting here, again, lateral load versus lateral displacement on the structure. So we started off today with a first order elastic analysis. Uh, woof, that's not really that close to the actual. Um, we did take a look at some buckling analysis, some critical load analysis. The elastic one, not there, inelastic, a bit closer. Then we moved on and do a second order elastic. And if we get enough load on there, we will achieve an elastic stability point, an elastic instability. Uh, then we could, of course, go uh, material nonlinear, still first order, and that will eventually find us the controlling plastic mechanism. For those of you that have used the classical methods, either the lower or upper bound approaches, they're, they're very educational. And the problem is when you try to do a real problem, you've got to think of all the different mechanisms. All right. This one will, of course, find the controlling one, and uh, it's a little, a little easier on, on, your, on your calculator. Um, finally, if we combine the two, our first order, and we'll actually do a second order and an inelastic, uh, we will reach a uh, instability that's often very close to the, the actual behavior. And we can actually model, also model the unloading portion of the structure once we pass the stability point, so we can get a feeling for um, you know, uh, the ductility left in the structure. So it's kind of kind of fun to see that. So uh, you, you do have a, a final exam out there. I don't know if you, you got probably two homeworks, uh, well, two handouts. One was, one was green. Uh, the green one uh, is uh, asking you to, to solve this problem. All right, so, and that's uh, all the different methods. And it's due back a year from now in Nashville. So uh, hope to see you there. Uh, so. Let's uh, sort of wrap things up. So this morning what I tried to do, and I hope I didn't insult anyone's intelligence, but I tried to come in at, at a bare bones minimum, just introduce some nonlinear analysis. Unfortunately, to do that, I had to spend some time going through the direct stiffness method. But I showed you kind of some general points of material nonlinear analysis, some general points of second order analysis. We went for the full show there, second order inelastic. And again, these critical load analysis are becoming popular. Uh, again, the cool guys call them eigenvalue analysis. I don't know if that's so impressive, but, uh, but uh, so I wanted to just give you a quick review of those. Um, no matter what, when you do a nonlinear analysis, the trick there, the, the program is not moving loads or doing anything like that. All they're continuing to do is modify member stiffness. That's how they're getting there. All right, so just think about how are you modifying the stiffness to account for second order effects, material nonlinear effects. Tried to give you an overview of the availability of Mastan 2. I do hope you'll download it and give it a try. We've had uh, great success with it at many universities throughout the U.S. and really throughout the world. Um, it's just a real simple program to pick up and get yourself started looking at nonlinear analysis. Okay, so now it's your turn to to take a spin. Um, your handout. There is an appendix, 
So a few more examples to try. I often get asked, is, is there a reference book out there on nonlinear analysis? Uh, of course, here's my opportunity to promote, you know, my PowerPoint book as well. But no, um, no what uh, I think um, Bill McGuire and, and Dick Gallagher were the original authors of this matrix book that came out in 1976. And they took a real a shot at trying to present linear elastic analysis for the practicing structural engineer. When we came out with the second edition in 2000, we also had a real eye towards the practicing structural engineer. Um, and we included half the book now, we wrote half the book on nonlinear analysis. So nonlinear analysis is a little scary when you start looking at reference texts. There are some, some monsters out there with lots of math and all of that. But um, so if you're looking for a reference, I, I think it would be an okay one. Um, there's a tutorial that comes with Mastan. I printed out that tutorial. The tutorial, it's in green there. That tutorial is actually the solution to your final exam. All right, but don't tell anyone. All right, so, all right, well, time to jump in and start driving. So I'd like to thank you very much for this opportunity to spend some time with you. Thank you.